So previously we've discussed the, when a solution forms, uh, it is primarily the solvent-solute interactions, if they're more favorable than the solute-solute or even solvent-solvent interactions, a solution will form. Now one of those interactions, of course, we discussed in intermolecular forces was the ion-dipole interaction. Okay, uh, if sodium chloride dissolves in water, it turns out that it dissociates into its two ions, and then, of course, the partial positive or partial negative charges associated with the water molecules will um, form electrostatic attractions, and if they're strong enough, more favorable, they will make a solution. Uh, that uh, process for ionic compounds is in stark contrast to what occurs when a molecule or, or most molecules dissolve in solution. Uh, all uh, salts, inorganic ionic compounds, uh, dissociate uh, when they dissolve in the solution, meaning they break up into their uh, corresponding cations and anions. And as you can see pictured here, many waters of solvation uh, associate themselves around the ion to um, create a more favorable, more stable, lower energy uh, complex. Molecules such as sugar molecules, say glucose or fructose or sucrose, um, or any other soluble uh, molecule do not dissociate, meaning that none of the covalent bonds break. Only their dipole-dipole or hydrogen bonding um, interactions uh, will take place, not breaking any covalent bonds. But if those are more favorable, they will dissolve, but again, they do not dissociate. Okay. What this creates are two very different physical properties of ionic compounds and molecules in that um, ionic compounds, when they, when they dissolve, they dissociate into ions and they form conducting solutions. And uh, if you put two electrodes in a uh, solution that contains ionic compounds such as sodium chloride, uh, electricity can flow through the solution from one electrode electrode to the other electrode and completing this circuit uh, enabling this light to light up. Okay, and that's because of the dissociation uh, forming ions, which we refer, now refer to, or now we can refer to as electrolytes. Since molecules such as sugar molecules do not do that, they do not create non, or they do not create a conductive solution. They're non-conductive. We refer to those as non-electrolytes. Um, you you know that your body needs electrolytes. Um, you know salts. Uh, so that you can make conducting solutions, uh, various processes of including you know, you know, neuromuscular junction where you need ions um, uh, and so forth. So a uh, very important process in a lot of uh, chemistry and of course biology. There's actually a third um, type of solution which we can refer to as weak electrolytes. Uh, when we discuss uh, acids at more uh, more in depth in the next unit, uh, we will show you that there are also weak acids, such as acetic acid and vinegar, that do not uh, completely ionize or create the H plus ions in solution. Uh, they only do it partially. These are known as weak acids, and therefore they can they create weak electrolytic solutions, and we call them weak electrolytes. Now, macroscopically or physically, what that occurs is that a weak electrolyte. Uh, can conduct electricity, can light up a light bulb, but not as well as a strong electrolyte such as uh, sodium chloride, any other soluble ionic compounds, or even strong acids. Uh, and again, molecules that aren't acids do not dissociate and therefore do not create electrolytic solutions. One uh, important aspect uh, that we have to consider is the concentration of solutions because of this new dissociation process that we're discussing. Okay, if we say that we have a one molar sodium chloride solution, what that really means is, well, that sodium chloride is going to dissociate into sodium and chloride aqueous ions. So we really don't have a one molar sodium chloride solution. We have a one molar sodium cation solution and a one molar chloride ion solution. Okay, another way of showing molarity in terms of concentration is to use brackets. So we can put chloride in brackets, and we say that's a one molar ion solution. Okay, but we know that there's plenty of other um, for, uh, ionic compounds, and 
due to the stoichiometry of the dissociation, the concentrations might be different. We can say that we have a one molar magnesium chloride solution, but we know that magnesium chloride is MgCl2, and therefore would dissociate into one mole of magnesium plus two cation for every one mole of magnesium chloride, and two chloride ions for every one magnesium chloride mole. So we'd have to say that the concentration of magnesium 2 plus, the cation, is one molar, but the concentration of chloride is two molar, double that because of the stoichiometry. So something you now have to consider when discussing the concentration of ionic compounds. Speaking of concentrations, it turns out that there's a lot of other um, concentration terms that we can discuss. Um, besides molarity, uh, which is uh, very useful for solution stoichiometry, but depending on the um, application, uh, you might need other um, concentration terms that are more convenient. Okay, so here's molarity, um, sort of the go-to concentration term for a lot of chemistry and even a lot of biological applications. Uh, we'll see some uh, applications of molality, which we abbreviate small m, and that is the amount of solute in moles, but the mass of the solvent in kilograms. And again, that's just solvent, not solution. Okay? We could have the mole fraction of either the solute or the um, solution, and that is the amount of the solute, say, in moles, and then the amount of the solute and solvent in moles. And since that's a fraction, it doesn't have any units. But we'll see um, in the various colligative properties where that is um, applicable. We can also do a percent composition by moles instead of mass or volume. It's amount of moles and solvents, number of moles of solutes and solvent and moles again, times 100, and we get percentage. Now with um, parts by, we can say parts by mass or parts by volume, and we already talked about percent uh, composition by volume or excuse me, and, or uh, percent composition by mass. And what we do is you take the mass of the solute, mass of the solution, and then you multiply by 100 for percentage. Okay, another way to think about that is parts per 100. Okay, if you have a very dilute concentration, you might, um, it might be a lot more convenient to discuss things in parts per million. Uh, percent composition of an aqueous solution of lead would be highly toxic. Uh, so it's much more applicable to when discussing concentrations of, say, lead or mercury in drinking water in parts per million, and much more appropriate even parts per million. What you're going to do is you're going to take that same uh, multipl uh, same uh, fraction, mass of solute over mass of solution, and instead of multi by, multiplying by 100, we're going to multiply it by a million for parts per million, or a billion times for uh, parts per billion. And you can do the same... Um, calculations for parts by volume, just like we did for percent by mass and percent by volume. 